And for more, let's go to Lancaster in England. Simon Mabon is lecturer in international relations and Middle East studies at Lancaster University. Your books include Saudi Arabia and Iran, Power and Rivalry in the Middle East. Thank you for speaking with us here on France 24. Thanks for having me. Uh, first off, your reaction to uh, what you just heard from our reporter there, that the deal was uh, brokered by China. Yeah, I, I think this is an interesting one because what's been going on over the past months and indeed the past couple of years is a number of different diplomatic initiatives aimed at resolving tensions, hostility between these two states, between the Saudis and the Iranians. I think that the Chinese point is really fascinating, but China has come into this relatively late in the game. It's been a, a long-standing, arduous process of getting this, this agreement reached, but obviously China has helped to get it over the line, and I think that's hugely significant. What do you make of the timing? Uh, on the Friday, we have this major announcement, and just the day before, Saudi Arabia's foreign minister in Moscow. Yeah, I think, again, that's, that's pretty significant in the sense that it highlights the, the real complexity of, of U.S.-Saudi relations and the fractious relationship between Riyadh and Washington, which has been long a central component of regional security. The U.S. has been a key ally of Saudi Arabia, and that in turn has been a real source of friction between the Saudis and the Iranians. So I think with Riyadh pivoting away from Washington, or at least appearing to, you see the, the possibly the the, uh, the green shoots of a new type of order emerging in the Middle East. Uh, pivoting away or driving a hard bargain. The New York Times reporting uh, this Friday that Saudi Arabia is seeking security guarantees from the U.S., uh, help with developing a civilian, civilian nuclear uh, program, and uh, fewer restrictions on U.S. arms sales in exchange for the normalization of ties with Israel. Yeah, I think that's another complexity going on here, that the Saudis are... <laughs> Or engaging with Israel, I don't think that's a particularly uh, secretive thing, but they are not ready to normalize, unlike their other states in the in the Gulf, the Emirates, Bahrain, etc. Because the the repercussions, the ramifications of that go far beyond the political realm and include um, broader reverberations across the Muslim world. And for that, I think the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will need a great deal in response. Uh, from the U.S. And I'm also not sure that the Saudis will will want to give this victory to Joe Biden. The Saudis and Joe Biden are not particularly close. And so I think that's an additional complexity and uh, an additional layer of, of, of issues and potential trouble. Do you think that the U.S. would ever say yes to Saudi developing uh, nuclear power? Well, the Non-Proliferation Treaty the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty allows states to pursue a civilian nuclear um, power capability. But the worry is that the Saudis would be developing this to have some type of breakout capability if Iran was to uh, pursue its own nuclear weapons program. So that would be the big concern, and that would really uh, evoke fears of nuclear proliferation across the Middle East, which is the sort of the nightmare scenario for many. So I can't imagine the U.S. would be particularly keen to do that. But we also know that Saudi Arabia is trying to transition away from its reliance on oil. We know that the kingdom is trying to move away from the, the reliance on oil and natural gas, trying to pre uh, create a new type of politics, a new type of economy. And so it could be that that is just another part of that broader diversification away from oil and gas. And uh, will it be, as uh, many in Tehran, you heard our, uh, Reza Saye saying, are hoping, uh, uh, will it be the start of more auspicious uh, times for the, for the whole of the region? I'm thinking in particular of Yemen. Well, I think Yemen has long been the sticking point here. Um, with the Saudis and the Iranians engaging in this diplomatic activity over the past few years, getting a concrete solution to the Yemen crisis that will placate Saudi fears about Houthi attacks in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been the key sticking point. And it seems to me that if the Saudis have reached an agreement with Iran, then they've figured out a way of either extricating themselves from Yemen or guaranteeing their security. But my big fear with all of this 
is that this will be an agreement that neglects, ignores and marginalizes Yemenis themselves who have been suffering tremendous hardship and huge pressures, huge catastrophes over the past decade with conflict, with environmental challenges, and now with huge food shortages stemming from the war in Ukraine. How would it sideline Yemenis themselves? Well, this looks like it is the type of agreement that is in the realm of high politics. It's the type of agreement that the Saudis and the Iranians would make with elites. And those elites are kind of regional actors. They're not necessarily listening to, hearing, articulating the voices, demands, concerns of ordinary Yemenis who are struggling to, to put food on the table, to survive, to get medicine for their children, to, to allow them to go to school. The basic needs of people who are struggling in conflict zones. And I would be a little bit wary if those needs are actually being met by any type of broad, high-level agreement. But it could mean an end to the civil war there, perhaps. Perhaps. And that would be the hope. And of course, this is a, a moment of optimism. It's a, a moment where we should be hopeful. And if this is a type of positive agreement that the Saudis have managed to, to, to get with Iran that means that Yemenis are, are able to put down their weapons, then I am, I'm incredibly um, pleased and thankful. But the conflict in Yemen is not just about Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's also about local grievances. It's about control of territory. It's about access to politics. It's about a vision for the state. And these are not matters that can be uh, can be negotiated away by elites in Riyadh and Tehran. So I am a little concerned about that. One, one final question. You know, this, sure. if, if there is this warming of relations taking place uh, between Iran and it follows a thaw uh, between Saudi Arabia and Turkey, uh, we have uh, are, are you. Uh, surprised at the way Mohammed bin Salman has rolled with the punches, the Saudi crown prince. You mentioned earlier uh, the enmity between him and uh, the current U.S. president. Yeah, he's a pragmatist. Mohammed bin Salman is a pragmatic leader who wants to transform the kingdom. He wants to transform it away from this reliance on oil and gas. And to do that, he needs financial investment. He needs huge amounts of foreign direct investment in his uh, Vision 2030 projects in NEOM, in the grand projects that he has in mind. And you can't attract that type of investment from foreign actors if there are regional conflicts. And that involves transforming the types of relations that have characterized regional politics in the Middle East away from conflict and into a more pragmatic area of possibility. Bearing the hatchet with Iran, does that make it uh, easier for Saudi Arabia to win the bid to host the World Cup? Quite possibly. I think there are other issues at play and they are um, the continued rivalries within the GCC, but they are smaller issues. I think uh, reducing tensions with Iran will go some way to uh, placating FIFA's concerns, uh, placating the global community's concerns about conflict in the Middle East again. So, yeah, I think it's another step in that direction. Simon Mabon of Lancaster University, thank you for being with us here on France 24. Thanks for having me.